Hello everyone, welcome back to Road of His Overtime on Road of His Radio, brought to you by Blue Wire. My name is Colin Kelly, you can follow me on Twitter, at Overtime Ireland, and as always, joined by Sean Siegel. Sean, we are finished up our recap show again this week, lots of good uh, feedback on it, really enjoying doing those. I know they're bright and early, I even noticed listening back that my voice is a little bit different in those early morning shows, recording those at 6.30am my time, but... People really enjoying getting your instant reactions, our thoughts on some of those games. We didn't cover them all, so we will cover some more of them on today's show as we get ready to kind of move towards week four. We'll be doing it in a, an interesting way today as we look at maybe some underperforming or injured running backs and how to change your roster from maybe what was a hero RB team or maybe it was a robust RB team, but maybe those running backs aren't performing and how to shift that mindset now as we enter week four to a zero RB mindset to build that roster out to make sure it can compete come the end of the season we'll also be linking in some of those games that we didn't touch on earlier this week in our recap show but sean week four is getting close thursday night football should be an absolute banger it is the dolphins at the Bengals, so looking forward to that one usually thursday night games can be a little bit of a snooze or a sleeper that you want to maybe miss out on those games but that one is going to be a whole lot of fun a whole lot of fantasy implications linked into it with both of those teams actually winning in week three but sean we get ready for week four we're moving in that direction how are you set up for for this week well i'm excited all right and it's been so much fun to watch these first three weeks of nfl games we've had surprises we've had superstars we've had young players play well you know we've had unfortunate injuries that's always a part of it we've had really a surprising number of teams maybe that are awful but that's also part of sports and life. It's, you know, things are challenging, right? And so you watch a game like the Texans bears, and sometimes that can feel a little bit like a microcosm of, of life in general. It's certainly one of the reasons why television shows where people are dealing with their personal foibles and the hurdles and obstacles, travails of life. If it's done with a little bit of humor can, can be fun, can be cathartic. I don't know if watching bears, Texans is cathartic. Probably if you have Justin Fields or Damian Pierce, it's not. Pierce looked fantastic in the first half, swarmed under in the second half as the Chicago Bears didn't really have to worry too much about Davis Mills and the passing game. It's been a rough go for Brandon Cooks through three weeks. It's been a rough go for Nico Collins, who was drawing a lot of buzz in the preseason He evidently looked good against the Texans defense in camp, which is perhaps a little bit different than looking good against an actual NFL team. We don't necessarily want to start out on a down note, but I think you've led us us into the Bears Texans. I think that's what we have have to start on, Sean, and that can't be described as anything other than a, a down note. You mentioned like, you know, some things people watch on TV is for entertainment, for enjoyment. If you want to go back and watch, you know, the game pass or the, the cut-ups of the, the Texans Bears game, that feels like more torture than something that we'd be doing for enjoyment. I was talking to Sean before we kicked off the recording today, and I did apologize. I made the call this week to go with Justin Fields and our FFPC main event team over Aaron Rodgers. Then Saquon Barkley has a really solid game on Monday Night Football. So that decision actually cost us a W there. So I had to apologize to Sean. Sean said then to me that he was going to make the pitch to start Aaron Rodgers, but if if I'm you know the Green Bay Packers fan is and uh, go with the Bears quarterback, there's the uh, that was that was the reason. But eight of seventeen, Sean for 106 yards, two interceptions for Justin Fields, and I think this is an opportunity for us to to pair it back into that zero RB conversation because when we talk about the running backs, David Montgomery picks up an injury in this game, he's going to be missing out for a little while on the ground. Fields does go eight for 47, which Maybe there's a little bit of a bright spot, but the big bright spot for the Bears here was Khalil Herbert. 20 rush attempts, 157 yards, two touchdowns for him. Also gets two for 12 through the air. And that actually leads him with the most receptions on this Bears team because I said to you before the show, the the kind of the ship feels like it has sank with the Chicago Bears. We have Cole Komet, we have Darnell Mooney, both just unusable at this point two receptions for Komet for 40 yards two receptions for Mooney for 23 yards Herbert is the bright spot here and I guess if we're looking at it from the David Montgomery side looks like he's going to miss some time 
but Herbert has in the past when he's played and currently just looks so much more explosive than Montgomery. So if you don't have Herbert at the moment, you're probably going to struggle to get him on your roster this week. But again, some of the names that we'll talk about throughout the show may be able to be acquired. If you are a David Montgomery owner, how did you feel about Khalil Herbert this week and, and what he was able to do in a Bears offense who has been able to do nothing to this point of the season in terms of nice offensive play? Yeah, Herbert was astonishingly good. And this, again, kind of gives us a feel for what you can do and the kind of production you can get out of a zero RB approach. You look at the top running back scores from week three, and this has been a trend, but you get the 31 points from Herbert. Then Derrick Henry in there, he bounced back. He looked good. He caught some passes in addition to showing his trademark rumbling downhill style as a runner. Overall, the offense actually did not look very good. They were able to bottle him up a lot more in the second half. So I guess probably skepticism is still deserved on the Titans, even though this was a breakout game for Henry for his 2022 season. He did start with one bad game in 2021 before he lit the world on fire. It's going to be a tougher path here, even though Traylon Burks had a nice play early, gets tackled at the one. That's really unfortunate if you started Burks in any leagues because That was more or less the end for him. He did drop a fourth down conversion pass late in the game. That's not the kind of move that's going to get coaches to believe in you. Big picture, however, Traylon Burks, someone who is going to need to be part of that offense. If Derrick Henry is going to do what he needs to do, you just need to have that other weapon in there to threaten the defense. But you have Herbert Henry up top, then you have Jamal Williams, obviously very Frustrating, sad one for those of us who are loaded up on DeAndre Swift, but he looks like he's going to have a big fantasy impact in the near future. Then Devin Singletary with all those receptions that we talked about on Sunday night. Saquon rumbling in there with his highlight touchdown run last night and being active in the receiving game. Unfortunately, he was pass blocking a ton in that one. The messages that I got from people rejoicing about his overall performance also mentioned that as a caveat and a real frustration. But then Cordero Patterson, James Robinson, again, electric. He breaks off another long touchdown run in this game. Ramondre Stevenson, Damian Pierce, before you get down to Nick Chubb, the next real star. One of the things here is it does get a little bit skewed in terms of talking about how the running back scoring is working. Because if you are an elite running back drafter, then you really only have a handful of players to choose from, right? You've got those guys up at the top and we do hear all the time. Oh, all of the best seasons, all of the best scores come from that range. If you're a zero RB drafter or someone who is encouraging folks to build their rosters in a certain way, you have the entire rest of the running back universe to pick from. It doesn't mean you're going to have all of those guys on your team. We don't have a lot of Khalil Herbert that, is unfortunate we don't have a lot of jamal williams so just because you constructed your team in that way doesn't mean that you're going to be the beneficiary of some of these hits but again one of the things that we're seeing in 2022 is that the league is changing in a way that is very beneficial for these types of guys we have a lot of players in that first two three round range who have aged into just a scary zone. And you think about Alvin Kamara, he looked fantastic in the first half of this game and basically doesn't end up scoring any fantasy points because if your offense is built in a certain way, then it's just very difficult to do. And that was the other issue kind of going into this year. You look at some of these teams and Ezekiel Elliott gets a goal line touchdown yesterday. That kind of saves his day and makes his first three weeks score not look as bad as it would have been. Now it still doesn't live up to where he was drafted, even with how much cheaper he got. But you have some of these teams, Dalvin Cook with the big game, that then gets the shoulder injury. You have so much exposure to these potentially disastrous outcomes when your team is built heavy on the running backs early on. So one of the things that you mentioned is that if you drafted an anchor RB team and One of the reasons that we sometimes refer to this as modifies your running back, and sometimes it's more or less tongue-in-cheek, sometimes it's a little bit more seriously, but we're talking about a contingency-based drafting approach where you've got that anchor running back, 
you're sort of diversifying it running back across teams as opposed to trying to build it within a team. But when you diversify across teams like that, then I mean, you're going to get hit by some of these running back injuries and then not have a lot left among the stars. And so very quickly, you have to be shifting your mindset to think, okay, well, this is the same thing as if I have a zero RB team where one of my early wide receivers goes down and I've built enough wide receiver firepower that I can get through. You have a Garrett Wilson, you have a Devontae Smith, you have a Drake London, you have a Romeo Dobbs. Maybe if you're a drafter who prefers a little bit more of the veterans, we had the article talking about how it's not really our style, but if you want a veteran volume play, then someone like Christian Kirk is a great way to do it. He's undervalued, not a target, but undervalued. Well, through three weeks, he's someone who has been even more undervalued than we discussed. And so there are paths to get enough wide receiver firepower there that you can make a real play during the bye weeks. Even though you use that early pick at running back, you can still bludgeon people at receiver. And that's the reason why a lot of people will recommend doing the anchor RB approach is that if you then draft the right profiles and enough wide receivers, you can still accomplish a lot of the same things that we want to accomplish. Now that you've lost that star running back, you've lost your DeAndre Swift, the thing that you have to do is you know, definitely not panic, definitely don't give up, work through some of these, had some zero RB stash options last week. I mentioned a player that you can stash who probably won't be involved instantly for the Detroit Lions, but uh, there's a guy who finished in the top five for fantasy playoff scoring last season, who is on the Detroit Lions roster, a better fit for the DeAndre Swift role, a better athlete than Jamal Williams and Craig Reynolds. So you can think about stashing him. Frequent listeners probably know who that is. Anybody who can pull up the Lions roster can figure out who it is. If you want, obviously you can check the entire reasoning in the article. But there are a lot of plays like that throughout the fantasy landscape right now. One of the plays that we've been making, and it's really only going to help you in best ball because you wouldn't have started him this week really in any situation, but Samaj P. Ryan is able to show, number one, that he's probably pretty decent, and that number two, he does have that tiny little bit of standalone value. He can steal some points. He did steal some points from Joe Mixon in week three. A disastrous week from Mixon, but again, as long as he's the starter, he's probably going to get you know, at least vaguely in the vicinity of justifying his draft position because there's so much embedded value for the running back in that offense. Colin, let me throw it back to you and ask you this. Herbert is not one of the players that we prioritized. He wasn't on the zero RB watch list. And one of the reasons for that is the quality of this Bears offense. And so when we're putting the, the zero RB watch list together, it certainly isn't something where we expect to hit on everybody. These are contingency-based plays. If the guys were obvious, they'd be drafted earlier. A lot of the plays may take till the end of the season to hit. That's one of the things that we saw last year with Sony Michelle and Rashad Penny and Devin Singletary. And you've got to figure out a way to get there, which means having an overall strong team in the first place. But... Herbert not on the list. It, it also doesn't mean the players who aren't on the list couldn't hit. But the reason why he was not on there is the Chicago Bears are bad and appear pretty committed to David Montgomery. Now, Herbert was absolutely fantastic last season. He was so good and he was so clearly better than Montgomery, even as a rookie, that I put a lot of trade offers out for Montgomery and Dynasty, assuming that his price would have really plummeted as a result. That didn't necessarily happen, wasn't able to get him. You could understand why those Montgomery managers sort of stuck to their guns and probably rightly stuck to their guns when once Montgomery came back, he filled right back into that starting position. He looked pretty good down the stretch. I think he's looked good in the early going here. Montgomery has actually been a little bit better than I've expected as an NFL back. There are so many similarities between Montgomery and Damian Pierce. Pierce looked awesome in the first half of this game. 
The problem that you have with Montgomery is the same problem that you have with Pierce, which is that even if the back is good, which it looks like Pierce will be, you still play for the Houston Texans in Pierce's case. You still play for the Chicago Bears in the case of Montgomery and Herbert. So you really need to be a Nick Chubb type of talent to be in a situation where, number one, you have to have that injury first to unlock you. Herbert has gotten that. A lot of the backups won't get that throughout the course of the season. But then you have to have this unbelievable talent level to get through what is a bad team situation. Herbert, very talented. Again, you pull up his stats in the Advanced Stat Explorer from his rookie season. They really pop. He was mentioned as sort of a bonus play in our look at the young guys who had superstar potential during the offseason. But what he did in this game, I, I think in many ways is beyond sort of the wildest imagination, right? I mean, he was unbelievably good. Just unbelievably good. And the ability to break tackles when going you know, right, right up the gut into the line, the ability to get to the edge and then break off a huge play. When you have the type of game that he had in this type of game where, where the offense isn't doing anything else, when you carry 20 times for 157 yards and two rushing touchdowns, then you broke off some big plays and you also churned out a lot of tough yardage you know, it's going to sound like hyperbole. Probably it is in some ways, but I don't know that there are five better running backs in the entire NFL right now. That's how good he was in limited touches as a rookie. And that's how good he was in week three. Just absolutely astonishing. I didn't think that was the direction the question was going to come in. Basically, do I think that that's going to make him a top five running back? I thought it was going to be like his are, are, is people going to overhype him and then and then sean gives us that so i think he looked absolutely astonishing the one thing i will say you mentioned david montgomery i thought david montgomery looked really good against the green bay packers a week ago it felt like in that game though the packers were just going to let the bears rush themselves into oblivion and not really give up any big plays against them that particular game my concern with herbert would probably be the amount of work that he's got as a receiving back since he entered the nfl so obviously he's a rookie last year we've seen limited opportunities for him but week five week six week seven week eight they are the games where he comes in and pretty much has a, a full workload there in that particular time we do see him get three targets five targets two targets the five target game obviously is as a you know it's solid but that is the career high is the five targets for five receptions 33 yards outside of that he only has one other game above three targets in his career and then obviously at the weekend, he gets the two targets. So I would like to see him be used more in the passing game to obviously give him that floor from a weekly basis. But in terms of his rushing ability in those games, in week five last year, eight for 75, 19 for 97 and a touchdown, 18 for 100, then 23 for 72. So he is proven when he's getting that work that he's actually getting the yards as well. I'd say about, you know, 23 for 72 isn't going to be you know getting you too excited but i think that sean the notes that you've had on there i think that if he's available in leagues this week people should just be putting all their dollars down on the table to try and get him on the roster he is kind of the, the concern that i think you're leading out there is when it's a case that if montgomery is back in week six or he's back in week seven he's back in week eight whenever he does come back do they just go back to montgomery because that's what we've seen last year that's what we've seen to start this season and that would be the concern the hope with somebody like Khalil Herbert would be that when he goes in, he does what he did in that four-game stretch last year and that the Bears realize their mistakes. But if we're looking at this Bears offense in 2022, there's a lot of mistakes being made and they are not realizing them at all. So they could go back to Montgomery. So if you have him as an opportunity to get him on your roster, it might be a case that in four weeks' time when Montgomery's back, depending on how long it takes for him to come back, that you may be back to a situation where you can't trust him as a fantasy starter. Is that kind of where you were leaning when you started at that point? Uh, yes and no. I guess I'm not worried that Montgomery is going to go back in and take all of the work. It could be a worse situation in that it's a fairly even split. And then neither player is that playable for the reasons that you're mentioning. Now it's a different coaching staff than the one we saw last year where he wasn't getting targets, but in many ways it could be a worse situation since this team just doesn't want to pass the ball at all. <laughs> they don't. And so the 
receiving upside is going to be limited. The overall offensive context is terrible. And from that perspective, I mean, there's a reason that Nick Chubb isn't drafted in the first round, despite being right there with Jonathan Taylor as the best running back in the NFL. If you're going to split some time, if your offense isn't good, if you're not going to catch a lot of passes, there's a limit to what your fantasy scoring profile can be. And so a lot of fantasy managers are going to understand that. That's the reason that we weren't on it. Also, you're not going to play the Houston Texans every week. And so a lot of NFL defenses are competent and are not going to allow these highlight runs, even if the running back is awesome. I mean, Jonathan Taylor doesn't break out for massive games every week. He's been held down in consecutive games now. He was held down more or less completely by the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs, I mean, one of the things that they've got to be frustrated there, especially the defenders outside of Chris Jones, who sort of caused the problem is that the Chiefs defense looks fantastic through three weeks, and yet they managed to lose the game to one of the worst teams in football. You're going to be able to stop these backs when the opposing team isn't just a complete and total train wreck. And so from that perspective, it gets tough. But I do think it's interesting because Herbert and the talent there, we talk all the time about pursuing talent. I think this is just yet another data point suggesting that Herbert, despite where he was drafted, despite some of that background, you know, despite some of the sample size issues that you have when you look at what he did as a rookie, it just it gets more and more difficult to not look at him as one of the better running backs in the NFL. And you always want to have some exposure to that. So you look at the psychology of it and you think about dynasty. Now, it's not going to be the case everywhere, but there are going to be some situations in which it's actually easier to buy in dynasty after a big game because the opposing manager has been waiting for that type of game to sell the whole time. They're looking at people on their roster and saying, I believe in this player more than the community does. So why should I sell at a price that reflects the community's pricing instead of mine? But as soon as you have one of these games, then they feel like, okay, now the pricing is going to be more in line with my evaluation and I can move the player in order to, you know, if you're playing with someone who has 30 teams, (laughs) then they want to shift their exposures a bit. If you're playing somebody with two teams, maybe they don't want to get stuck with Herbert when they could have unloaded him at a great price at some point. So there are all different types of situations. There are going to be some dynasty managers out there who are like, thank goodness, this is what I needed. This is what I was counting on. Now I have a guy to score points at the running back position, which everybody covets. And so not everybody's going to want to sell, but there are going to be some managers looking at this and saying, Montgomery will be back. The Bears offense is bad. All these things that we've talked about. This is the chance to get out from under him. In those leagues, it makes sense to put some offers out. Now, again, all of these conversations base on or come down to what the price ends up being. And so you don't want to overpay. But you you want to think about some of these buy-sell trade decisions, not just from the perspective of buying low, but actually buying high. But it's not really buying high. It's just that this game has acted as a catalyst for even having that trade discussion in the first place, again, create as much exposure as you can to elite players. Final note I'm going to add in on the Bears, Sean, is that Justin Fields game. Justin Fields and the Bears are the first team to have three consecutive games with fewer than 10 completed passes since 2011. And that was uh, Tim Tebow and the Denver Broncos back in the day. But, you know, three games to start the season, fewer than 10 completed passes. It's, it's actually, you know, that's something that's, hard to do uh so let's hope that we get more than 10 completed passes in week four for the bears you mentioned some of the notes sean around the titans we will jump back to them in a second but last week on friday before week three you had a number of names or potential trade targets for people looking to you know bolster the running back depth with potential breakouts from those players i think they're still very very relevant in this conversation because we're looking at people that you could acquire or could add to your roster in case injuries happen because that is going to continue unfortunately to happen throughout the coming weeks it may be a case that some of the players you have aren't performing to the the level you're hoping to have so in that list sean we did talk about the chiefs in the previous game but jared mckinnon got worked in again for the chiefs tyler algier was getting worked in for the falcons as well and then samaji p ryan who you touched on already on the the show was was really getting worked in there for the Bengals, and he feels like he could be a real threat to Joe Mixon overall. But the next player, Sean, is Eno Benjamin. We'll move on to the Rams and the Cardinals. And there's a couple of running backs probably that people are having question marks in this one. Cam Akers didn't look great to start the season. Has a good game here. 12 for 61 touchdown for him. 
on the hind side or on the, the opposite side of that, Darrell Henderson was somebody who people thought had gone and you know comfortably won this job, not very much involved with just the 17 yards rushing. James Connor with his injury, 13 for 39. Eno Benjamin, five for 16 going his way. Williams, one for seven, not worked in very much. And then we do have the situation in this one where Marquise Brown goes for 140 yards and 14 receptions on 17 targets. Um, interesting game. Cardinals still really struggling to work through some issues that they have on offense. Not a huge amount happening on the Los Angeles side either, outside of Cam Akers and in all honesty. What are some of your thoughts on, on this particular contest and then overall on the, the kind of running back backfields here as to how people maybe should be moving in, in those directions? Yeah, Akers, somebody we've encouraged people to buy low on. I just... I like Daryl Henderson. I think he's one of the best pre-contact runners in football. And that's a profile that fantasy managers should be more excited about. It's a profile that reality teams should put a little bit more of an emphasis on. But, I mean, the Rams have never liked Henderson. And anytime that they play him at all, you get the impression that it's very grudgingly and that it's to motivate somebody else. So for Akers to step back in here and get 12 of the 16 carries, that part to me wasn't a surprise. He did look okay. He did fumble in a key moment that arguably got the Cardinals back in the game. It was a bad fumble. You just have to have better ball security there. I mean, we don't talk a lot about fumbles and all of that type of thing. They tend to be pretty random and when you de-emphasize players because they fumbled, you do your team more of a disservice in most cases. But it is something that happened. It is something that could stick in coaches' minds. I don't know that this situation here is one that is in any way settled yet. And Akers also didn't catch a pass in this game, didn't get a target. Henderson didn't catch a pass, does get a target. The passing volume to the back's probably keeps either of them from being that interesting in the short term. The Rams offense has been really pretty bad. This is a game where Stafford does average 10 yards per pass, but I mean, he just doesn't have much to work with here outside of Cooper cup. You have the four more targets for Higby. Now he was finally efficient in this game after his avalanche of targets in the first two weeks led to almost nothing. He does get the 61 yards Skoranek has a decent performance. He catches all four of his targets for 66 yards. The Cardinals finally are the first team in over a year. That's probably not the case. He probably had at least one bad game last season. But they do slow down Cooper Cup. Only six targets, only four receptions, only 44 receiving yards. If you were playing against Cooper Cup this week, you're probably thinking, well, I finally dodged that big bullet. And you did to an extent, but... They shut him down as a receiver. He carries and goes for a 20-yard touchdown. You just you can't stop Cooper Cup. He's too good. The person you can stop pretty easily, Allen Robinson, five targets, two receptions, 23 yards. He drops a touchdown. They were trying to get him involved around the goal line because he brings no value in between the 20s, but he's even struggling with that. Now, again, we're only three weeks in. It's a new team for him. They're going to continue to feel some need to justify that move, especially if Robert Woods starts to emerge a little bit for the Titans. So, I mean, things aren't over for Allen Robinson any more than they were over for Amari Cooper after his no-show in week one, bounced back with two extremely impressive games in weeks two and three. But one of the things I like about the early going column, we're still looking for Kyle Pitts to score more points. We talked about that on Sunday night. Blair had a really cool article on it that came out this morning. You want to check that out. The air share, the overall air yards, the competence of Marcus Mariota, the sidekick with Drake London, really everything about that play looks fantastic other than the points. It is still a case where you're concerned that Arthur Smith is going to figure out ways to mitigate the overall damage that Pitts does. But big picture, you're going to have injuries. It's pretty devastating to lose DeAndre Swift. That part is frustrating. But we don't have too many misses 
in the early going. You look at our wide receiver selections outside of the few teams with DJ Moore. DJ Moore, I mean, he's a much bigger talent than Allen Robinson. He is going to be much more of a focal point for that offense than Robinson is going to be for his. But <laughs> we talked about the Bears. The one offense that may be worse to watch in the entire NFL is uh, is the Panthers. I I just. Uh, I mean, is Matt Corral going to come back off IR at some point in the season? I hope so. And I hope it's just, so. I mean, you watch this game, and it was the first time that you ever think to yourself, like, what's the scoop with Sam Darnold? Can we get him in there? Because Sam Darnold is not as bad as Baker Mayfield. And Baker Mayfield has spent the entire first three weeks either throwing passes directly into the defensive lineman's hands or throwing these sideline passes that – are not even in the vicinity of the wide receivers. This is the worst offense that, I, I mean, this is an offense that makes what the Houston Texans are doing look like the pinnacle of NFL offensive prowess. So yeah, we, do, we do have the DJ Moore miss. So that one we have to put in there. But I love the way the wide receivers are looking. Now, the injury to Justin Herbert knocked down Mike Williams for week three. The injury slash situation with Russell Wilson has knocked down Jerry Judy. So those two guys, uh, another couple of names, and names kind of in that range that we discussed how that portion of the third, fourth round maybe a little bit weaker or at least risky. I thought that Jerry Judy was going to do a lot better. He does get deep for a potential long touchdown in this game, and Wilson just doesn't make the play. Now, it's a good play by the defensive back. A former Kansas City Chief, I do believe, gets his hand out there, knocks that pass away. <laughs> not a whole lot of interest from Judy on making a play on the ball, but I really think that he just did not expect the defender to get there. The lackluster effort from Judy was somewhat similar to Devontae Parker, who managed to have a game with 156 receiving yards in which he still <laughs> didn't make much of an effort on the throws that weren't sort of right there to him. Actually, I shouldn't say that. For Devontae Parker, we had some fantastic plays and then some really poor plays. So not consistent, a very wide range. Unfortunate thing there, obviously, Mac Jones. But you look at where these teams are building the receiver depth, all of the hits early. We don't have a lot of picks that are purely busted picks. Because even someone like DJ Moore, you expect them to be able to figure out how to get him going i like where we are with the team constructions and the various profiles heading into this next portion of the season i think there are some landmines in there to where if you picked a lot of these early running backs or you took some of the veteran wide receivers you're regretting maybe the lack of upside that those plays give you it's not that in the short term your team won't be good but you're looking especially then at, well, what happens when I have the lack of upside and then I go into the bye weeks, we should be able to make up a lot of ground and or gap some of these teams during that juncture. Colin, what do you think of the Cardinals? Marquise Brown, pretty disappointing, I thought, through the first two weeks. But in this game, really does start to feast on the fact that there's no one to take any target volume away from him. 17 targets here. He catches 14 of those. He and Murray didn't seem to be that in sync through the first couple of weeks. But you're getting 10 targets to Dorsch. You're getting 10 targets to Ertz. Kyler, Kyler Murray's not going to throw 58 passes in most games. This is another one of those games where one team's quarterback threw more than double of his peer, his opponent, in that game. As a result, we didn't end up with too much volume to the running back position, thankfully, because the efficiency level there was below 3.5 yards per carry. Yeah, I think it's interesting with Brown. Obviously, the first two weeks, nothing really clicking. He's in a situation where there's no Rondell Moore there. He's in a situation where there's no DeAndre Hopkins there. I think it, the way the Cardinals are playing at the moment is probably boding well for when those guys come back for them to step right into the wide receiver one, wide receiver two roles. And that's maybe not as much with Moore, but I think Hopkins is going to be the clear number one he's going to get these targets when it comes to a situation when he's back after his suspension 
the I did see some information around the you know the right tree and the the charting of where the passes were going, and it was pretty much the same things over and over and over again. It felt like the Rams may actually have been kind of given up some of those passes in those plays to allow him those so it still counts as fantasy points but in a game where you're behind the team a bit like i mentioned with david montgomery in the packers situation in week two sometimes the team are going to give you certain plays and try and see if they can force you into a mistake and that has been the case with kyler murray at certain points that patience isn't always a strong suit in terms of waiting and waiting and waiting to march all the way down the field so obviously 140 yards is a, a great takeaway but i have some concerns that that is not going to be very sustainable for him moving forward sean you touched on the panthers i'm just going to jump into a couple of things here but i have to start off with a plug for stadium signals with ben gretch he did have his comment about dj moore and the signals and he mentioned that dj moore probably wants to retire and he couldn't blame him so uh that, that may be one way to get dj Moore out of the situation in carolina but he has the six targets just the one reception for two yards he does have two rushes for 13 yards at the moment, it's one of those situations where he may come out in week four and have a big day, but it's going to be very, very hard to slot him into your season-long rosters with how things have been going so far. Christian McCaffrey, 108 yards and 25 rush attempts. Good that he is getting the rush volume, but the concern there is it is that can combined touches that he's getting or the combined opportunities. He gets four targets, two receptions, seven yards. You know, We would rather see that at you know, 12, 13 carries, 10 targets would be a much better way to be using Christian McCaffrey in this offense and Baker Mayfield just looks really bad I don't have the information right in front of me at the moment but I did see a stat where if you take out the two long touchdowns through three weeks that really and truly his stat line is is absolutely horrendous he's 170 yards and a touchdown in this but uh 67 yards that and a touchdown were based on the one long play to LaVisca Chenault which wasn't really a long play it was more that LaVisca Chanel done a lot after the catch so Baker Mayfield feels like an anchor holding down this offense but maybe it's a case where the offensive scheme is just so bad that it's not completely on Baker Mayfield so not that I'm cutting Baker Mayfield slack Sean but it feels like the the scheme here is is suboptimal as well on the other side Chris Olave I guess is the main talking point you mentioned Kamara struggled a little bit Olave had 13 targets nine receptions 147 yards i thought there was more value in these yards than there was with the more yards when we're talking about the cardinals but the obviously they're working from behind the whole way in this game trying to catch up so there's a lot of garbage time in there but olave in week two had a lot of air yards there's a lot of conversation you know could that be fulfilled into actual receptions but they went back to him and, and heavily heavily used him here i know michael thomas and jarvis landry missed some time in this game but Chris Olave looks to be 100% the wide receiver one for the Saints. Yeah, and I don't know that that's a huge surprise considering who he's competing with there. Not necessarily a surprise, but definitely an impressive outcome for him. You mentioned the historic level of receiving yards or air yards last week. He pops right back up among the league leaders. For this week, you've got Devontae Parker up there at 212. Devon, our guy Devontae Smith at 205, Elijah Moore at 186. He's someone we talked about on the Sunday night show that the air yards are there. The efficiency is not there. We have a somewhat hilarious zero yards after the catch for Elijah Moore, in part because the catches were few and far between. Josh Reynolds, 172, Kyle Pitts, 165, Olave at 164, Mark Andrews, 152, DK Metcalf, 150. A couple of tight ends. Not surprisingly, two of the three elite tight ends in that group. But Olave looks fantastic. The early season production from Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, I think also are a pretty positive sign for Jamison Williams. If you're stacked, stashing him in redraft, if you have him on your taxi squad in Dynasty, just some of the circumstantial evidence here is encouraging. I would strongly recommend making offers for him in any format where you can. I don't think that you can get Garrett Wilson or Chris Olave here. This rookie receiving group has been sensational. And yeah. yeah, exactly as you said. And 
And that's without, uh, well, Christian Watson drops that attempt in, in week one, but the Packers side of things, their rookies look sensational, but around the league, even the glimpses, you mentioned, you know, the opportunities in Tennessee this week. We have the situation you know, with the Falcons and Drake London. They, they are really delivering very early, and that's we, we talked last week about the golden age of wide receivers, but yeah, this class looks to be hits all across the board at the moment. Yeah, and there's might be even a tiny chance that you can get Jahan Dotson after Carson Wentz absolutely implodes. I think we've got to be on Sam Howell countdown at this. We're point. on the rookies. The rookie quarterback's going to hit two, Sean. It's all going to be good. Yeah, just a matter of time there. So, <laughs> if you followed the instructions from the Dynasty Workshop this off season and sort of launched your perpetual reload with the rookie draft. But as opposed to trying to buy these extremely expensive 2023 rookie picks, if you load it up on 2022 rookie wide receivers instead, those guys going definitely at a bargain to our rankings. Our rankings are looking good from that perspective at this point, just three games in that some things could turn around. The huge disappointment obviously has been Sky Moore. His rank and situation there in terms of where he was going in rookie drafts is ADP. And then you contrast that with some of their guys in the production on the field. Right now, the NFL's ranking of these players, where they had Dotson and Olave much, much earlier, Sky Moore, Christian Watson, George Pickens falling into round two. Pickens has been hurt more by the situation there. The other guys, I think you have to consider Watson a disappointment as well. But Romeo Dobbs looks fantastic i mean he looks like you're gonna wish you had spent a first round pick on him and so if you get a guy who's sort of at that three four turn in rookie drafts you load up there and he ends up being worth a first round pick that's the type of play that completely changes the dynamic of a dynasty team it's one of the reasons to load up on those selections and know that you're going to mostly miss but when you hit it does have roster changing and league changing repercussions very exciting to see all those guys play very exciting to see Devontae smith blow up elijah moore someone whose time is coming he's probably the most clear-cut by low in all of fantasy and again in all formats Many fantasy managers are pretty sophisticated at this point. He could be difficult to get, but one of the things that you deal with is just human emotion. And so if your league mate doesn't know just how good Moore's profile was coming into the year, if he doesn't understand how Garrett Wilson's emergence helps, if she doesn't know that Elijah Moore had 186 air yards this week, maybe you can get a little bit of a discount on him Man, it's been so fun to watch these rookies and these offenses, including the Jets, who haven't, who weren't as successful in week three. Colin, we're going to get some Zach Wilson, it sounds like. Yeah, it does sound like it. So we'll see. We'll have more on that when we get to Friday's show as we talk through our real thoughts, diving completely into week four. But that finishes kind of a brief kind of future look. We do everything with an eye to the future, Sean, and we also were looking back at some of the final steps of NFL week three hopefully you have enjoyed listening in today if you have enjoyed it please do leave us a written and review in your favorite podcast app if you're listening on the audio side of things drop us a comment give us a like and a subscribe on youtube if you are over there as we close in on 2000 subscribers on the rotoviz youtube channel if you are signing up to rotoviz.com or you're renewing your subscription you can use the code rv radio 2022 at checkout to save yourself 10 percent off a rotoviz nfl pass you'll get access to all of sean's work that's up on the website you'll get all of the access to the content and the tools all the other pieces that are up there that will help get your teams in top shape for the rest of the nfl season that's going to do us for today's episode of the show sean will be back with stadium bananas along with ben gretz as the week continues and then we'll be back on friday with one more final road of his ot ahead of nfl week four but until we are back with another show have a good one